Hi there. So in this video, we're going to be discussing how we quantify staining intensity in a few different contexts. Now, we might want to do this if it's not just as simple as counting stained elements in a picture. So in other videos, I talk about doing cell counts or particle counts in a picture. But sometimes the particles are not always the same brightness or the same staining darkness. So we need to know where those differences are because those may be meaningful. In particular, this tends to be used for things like certain blots, uh, certain things like gel electrophoresis, uh, Western blot having to do with the staining intensity of things, the size of the bands. But we can also use this in brain tissue or otherwise different types of tissue sections that we stain. The two examples I'll be showing here are doing it with fluorescent one channel images converted to a grayscale image. And in another case, doing a multicolor bright field image quantification. So the stuff that you look under a light microscope where the light is coming from beneath, illuminating the tissue and then shining it up to the eye pieces. And it's regular lighting rather than the fluorescent lighting that's blue or green or red and so on. So with that brief intro out of the way, I'm just gonna briefly show the protocol for anybody who wants to kind of just copy it down. So we have one initial page here describing purpose and the software being used. Again, we're going to be use, using Fiji, also known as image J. The image sources, depending on what you're trying to do, they can be fluorescent or chromogenic, or in other cases, just uh, stained images of tissue. This is the protocol for doing it with a single channel fluorescence image. So it's something that has been converted to grayscale. More instruction. This is how it can be done with a multi-channel or multi-color image, whether it's bright field or something that's a merged multi-channel fluorescence picture. Further instructions. And the stats I don't have listed here, it's admittedly been a little bit of a work in progress, but those may just depend on what sort of applications you have in mind. So without further ado, let's give it a go. So here we have an image open in MSJ. This is a Nissl stained image, and it may look somewhat familiar to people that work with the brain. You may have um, seen the structure before. This is a zoom in on part of the hippocampus, particularly around the area of the dentate gyrus. Nissl staining can be a bit more clean than this. There is a decent amount of background in this image. Part of the purpose of doing the stain was to assess different chemical variants in the process in order to see how much better or worse they make the stain appear. And one of the ways that we try to measure this was by highlighting specific areas and figuring out what their color intensity was. So in this case, we're gonna be doing a multicolor bright field image quantification first. Now, in order to try to quantify it, we need to select a region of interest. We don't need to change the picture to anything else. We wanna keep it in RGB mode. So that's for red, green, blue, it's a multicolor image. This gives us just the general uh, width and height of the picture, that's fine. We probably don't need real world units, but if you did have to convert, there are other examples I have in other videos. A brief once over on converting things into their uh, real world measurements is that you go to um, <clears throat> analyze set measurements. Oh, well, this box actually we're gonna be using later. Analyze set scale. Yes. So we'll have some sort of known distance in pixels. The known distance would be converted to one, aspect ratio is usually one, and unit of length might be something like micrometer. So let's say some of these pictures might be like 0.777 pixels for every one micrometer. And then we can see that put down here. And if you're doing this for a whole bunch of images taken with the same microscope, at the same magnification, you can just click global and not have to do this again until you open MSJ once again. So 
I don't know for sure that this is scale in this image, so I'm not going to click OK on this, but this is, for example, how you do that conversion. Now, to the more important matter, trying to figure out a region of interest. You can just draw with simple rectangular selection tool, as illustrated up here. So we could just draw a box in a given area, and then that could be it. You can also draw polygons, though, if you want a little bit more of a complicated picture. So if you're trying to follow along with this cell layer here, you can click, 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 in order to kind of just outline it as best you can. Then we'll cut it off there. Click, 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 and connect it here. So that can give us a region of interest that we actually have a little bit more control over rather than making it just a box that we stick on there. One of the other things we'll have to do is we'll have to set what measurements we care about. So we might want the area that we selected. That might be important, especially if you want to keep this consistent with multiple images that you're analyzing. So if the area is really different, that might be a problem or it might not matter. It depends on what kind of project you're running. Now, we have some other metrics here. We have mean gray value, we have standard deviation, we have the min and max gray value. So these are all for grayscale images. We won't really see these so much in this example with the multicolor image, but this will come up again when we talk about the fluorescence image. And we want the measurements to be set to the bounding rectangle or selection in another way. So we want to have it focus on the selection and not the whole image. We could also say redirect to this picture here to make sure it's focusing just on that picture if you have multiple pictures open in image J at the same time. You can click off all these other things um, if you want to have that information, but it would, may not be necessary. So we're also going to unclick limit to threshold. Okay. And so Let's hit OK with that. Now, we want to extract the color values. And it does it in R, G, and B, so red, green, blue. When we do this, we can go to Analyze Color Histogram. And this will give us a graph of approximately the color magnitudes of all the pixels involved. So it counts all the pixels in this area. It says that there are. 300 by 410 pixels, so whatever that multiplier ends up being. And each of these little tiny, tiny, tiny vertical black lines that forms these curves represents the color value of that pixel, or I should say the number of pixels that are of that color, actually. So we also get the mean values over here, and it conveniently throws those into a table from which we can copy those into a document. So we'll split these into red, green, and blue channels, and it will tell us, oh, this is the mean red value of all the pixels in this area. This is the mean green value, mean blue value. You can see that the blue value is very high. The number that is the maximum when it comes to color values and intensity values is 255. So if it's at zero, it means that for that color or that um, whatever the color is, it is effectively black at zero. And as we get closer to 255, it is more and more intense of that color. We can see that graphed here on the histogram again at the very bottom, where we see zero, all of these are basically black. But then as we get closer to 255, we get the more purified version of these colors, red, green, and blue. We also get standard deviations for how much the colors vary in the selection. So if there's a large standard deviation, it suggests to us that, oh, well, some might be a lot more red than others. But if we look at the standard deviation for a blue, there's a lot less variability, meaning that the blue values don't tend to differ between the different pixels here. And this is just for a general area rather than a cell structure. So you might be interested in trying to look at specific cells. And we'll get to that in a little bit. But for now, what you can do is you can either save these as individual table files, or what I actually recommend is just copy pasting these straight into an Excel or otherwise spreadsheet type program. I don't typically save the histograms, but it may be helpful, especially if you want to do some sort of area under the curve analyses. But otherwise, a lot of the same information about 
mean, standard deviation, and mode is all included here. Okay, so that gives us color values of just a general structure. What if we want to figure out the color values of individual elements, perhaps even cells within there? In particular, one of the things that I was interested in looking at in this project was trying to see how differentiation, uh, how, how effective it was for the reagents we tried to use. And so what differentiation is in these stains is that it will have the stuff that's supposed to stain be dark or really well stained. And the stuff that's not supposed to stain will have it wiped out. So the ideal differentiation for a picture like this is that anything that's sort of like this hazy, barely purple color should actually be more of a whitish color. And anything that's uh, dark purple should remain dark purple. That would be what a really effective differentiation would be like. In this picture, the differentiation is not so great. There are some other examples we can look at though. For instance, if I pull up an example from the rat brain atlas looking at a similar part of the brain or the same part of the brain we see that the differentiation is very stark and even though this is a little bit more of a pixelated image we see that between each of these very purple elements it is just a white background there isn't a hazy purplish tone to things it's either it's sort of dark purple dots or nothing around them so it might be of interest to you in some of these occasions to determine, okay, what is the signal to noise ratio? The signal being the stuff that's supposed to stain and how brightly that stains compared against how much the background is stained or is not stained. So this, a good signal to noise ratio means that your stain really pops out from the background. A bad signal to noise ratio suggests that you can't really tell the difference between what's supposed to be stained and everything else just being stained haphazard. So let's take another example. Let's open another picture here in image J that is a little bit more magnified. So if I go to the 10x magnification version of this picture, we can take a closer look. And image J doesn't really mind having multiple iterations open, so no need to really worry about that. few different things going on here. We can close this other one here, close this thing, and if you close the results box it'll always ask you if you want to save it. Um, that depends on you. We're not copying this down here, but in case you wanted to. We see in some of these examples that we have, uh, we have two windows open. Let me close one of these here. We have several cells that we could zero in on. So what I recommend is First, of course, acquiring a higher resolution photo than what I have here, or otherwise something that is uh, at a higher magnification. But you can zoom in by hitting Control Plus or Command Plus for Max. And then you could select your cell of interest. Try to select as much of the cell as possible. Oh, still in polygon mode. Hold on. Let me click that off real quick. You want to select as much of the cell as possible without selecting the surroundings, if possible. So this is not ideal, but this will do the trick for our purposes. And we can just go to um, Analyze, Color Histogram, and it gives us all that information again. You'll notice that the amount of pixels it selects, though, in this count uh, is only 572 in this case. So it's much fewer, and so we'll have to take a look at what is going on within this very small box. We could see that because there are fewer pixels, the look of these curves looks a lot more grainy. That is because there are fewer of these vertical lines because there are fewer distinctions between all of these different types of pixels. When we look at this, we see that there's a high blue value. The red and green values are relatively low, so it's still a very strong blue color. And then you could copy these results and put them into an Excel spreadsheet. We can then follow up with boxing in this region. Now, if you're trying to take in the same box size regions, you might want to standardize the size of these boxes. And so in order to do that, what I suggest is going to edit selection specify to see exactly how big your boxes are and adjust them accordingly with, with by height. 
and then you can grab them and move them once they're ready uh, by just clicking anywhere within the box to move it around like so. So assuming that you've standardized your box size, you then go to another area, you do the analyze color histogram, pops out another thing. The table is automatically overridden. So we see that everything has basically been converted to the new measurement for this box here. But it has not gotten rid of the previous color histogram, so we could do a little bit of compare and contrast still. So the original one that highlighted the cell body before is over here on the left, and this new box highlighting the regions between cells, or at least between stained cells, is here on the right. Now you might be thinking, well, that's weird. This doesn't look very blue, uh, yet the blue value is much higher in this case. That isn't telling the full story. Because remember, this is a multicolor image. When we have all the colors getting closer to maximum, remember that they come together to combine and make white. So even if we have a high blue value, if the other colors have a high value, eventually we're going to get lighter and lighter coloring. This just happens to be a very light blue. And light blue is not on the spectrum of just the blue channel. It needs to be created by adding the other colors on top of that. This is also important if you're trying to figure out what the mean intensity is of what you're looking at. The mean intensity is not just adding all these values together, it's not adding the means here together, it is the average of these means. So the mean intensity of what we have here is the average of 138 plus 152 plus 254. So whatever the average number is, it's still gonna be less than 255. It's not a complete white color, but it's still going to be an average of all of the three color components. And the intensity of the color, uh, as well as the intensity overall, those might be different and interesting questions that you might ask. For instance, there can be discoloration in the Nissel stain where things take on a weird pink color, and it might be of interest to look at just the red coloring of certain things. Otherwise, if we're looking at just general differentiation, we might want to have things that are closer to a white coloring for the background and a dark blue to purple coloring for the cell bodies and missile substances. Okay, so now, now we can um, move on to some of the fluorescent images. Let's go ahead and close all these. If we open up, uh, let me actually grab it through this folder here. If we open up some fluorescent pictures, we can look at a few examples within here. And I think one of the better ones might be, we could look at the hippocampus and look at what a fluorescent picture looks like for this. Go ahead, open with image J again. Here, although it seems dim, this is what a fluorescent image might look like. Typically, these are in grayscale for a single channels, meaning that when we take fluorescent images, we're not usually taking multiple colors at the same time. Instead, the camera will acquire whatever's in the blue range, it'll acquire whatever's in the red range, uh, it'll acquire whatever's in the green range. It might go a little bit outside that and give a fourth channel as well. But for our purposes, we've only isolated the red color range, and the program converts this automatically to grayscale, since it's only shades of red. We could always change the color back to red, but gray is probably the easiest to see, aside from green. Now, we could take a closer look here and see how we can exactly get mean intensity. So similar to before, we can just zoom in on parts of the picture, if it will let me, ah, okay, we can zoom in on parts of the picture, again, alrighty then, let's see if I could just open this properly once more, recent, yes, we're going to do this one once more, this bit. there we are, so we can zoom in, on a particular element here. And we can use the hand tool to pan around, but we see a similar sort of structure to what we did before, just now in grayscale, and with a black background rather than white. 
You can even convert, by the way, the Atlas Nissle stains into something to compare this against. For instance, what I did was I took some of those pictures from the Rat Frame Atlas and I desaturated them to create a bright field grayscale color, something like this, where I just took out the purple coloring. And then what you could do is you could invert the color scheme and then it looks something more like this. And then we could do a little bit of a side-by-side -side comparison accordingly. Obviously the stain is a decent amount dimmer, but that can be adjusted based on the camera's uh, gain and exposure and things like that. What's more important for our purposes is how well the differentiation went. So how dark is the surrounding tissue and how bright are the nissle bodies. And so we could look at that ratio by stemming that by zooming in on certain elements in the picture. So let me go ahead and draw that polygon again. Click, 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 click. And bam. And in this case, we want to check our set measurements once more. So we can look to make sure this area, we have mean gray value, so that's important. Min max gray value can also be helpful because if we're looking for what the maximum brightness of any one pixel in an area is, that might be helpful. We still got standard deviation. So all the stuff is still here again. We'll go ahead and divert it to here. So we'll hit okay. And now when we go to analyze, just measure. So we're not doing color histogram anymore. We're just doing analyze measure. It gives us a few values for this area. So the area is about 5,909 pixels squared, if you will. The mean, um, the mean value of some of these length and height type metrics is here. We've got a little bit of the min max value, the coordinates, and so on and so forth. We really need intensity measurement here, which we're not getting because, of course, this is not a number going up to 255. So let's see if we can get that here. Let's make sure that the type is 8 bit. Analyze measure. There we go. That's a little bit more appropriate. So, one of the things in my protocol, something that I overlooked here, is that when we're doing the regular grayscale fluorescence thing is that we have to have it in 8-bit format. Otherwise, it will not end at 255. The numbers will actually go far past that. So it might be a bit confusing looking at this first level here. We definitely don't need that. I'm just going to delete it from existence. So now this is giving us the correct numbers for our purposes. The mean gray value is 30 out of 255. Standard deviation of the stuff in here is only 6, so it doesn't vary very much. The min and max gray values are 13 and 52 out of, again, 255. So these are pretty dim, pretty pretty dark, going from the extremes of black at zero and white at 255. We also get some interesting metrics here for, I believe, the uh, left most corner here being at uh, placement x coordinate 557, y coordinate 581. The approximate width and height of the selected figure here these may not be too important for you if you're doing polygon selection, but might be a lot more important if you're doing, doing selection with boxes. So that's all well and good. What happens if I just move this to the side a little bit to do a comparison of the neighboring area? Well, we do analyze measure. And in this case, we see that the mean gray value is definitely less, as well as the minimum. The maximum does have a few brighter particles in here, but we're not too concerned with that. We're just concerned more with the average, with the mean here. So we just basically moved our area over to this neighboring brain region, and we see that it is indeed darker, and it's a lot closer to zero. So you might be wondering, what's the purpose of this? Well, if there's an area that should be devoid of stain versus an area that should have a lot of stain, you can figure out what the ratio is or, or the percent difference is between one versus the other. The ratio might be particularly important in order to try to figure out a signal to noise ratio. Now, we also might want to determine 
what things look like on a more cellular scale. So let's go ahead and grab another image that zooms way, way in. So we can look at the 10x version of the same picture. Now here, things look a little bit more brilliant because at higher magnification, stains tend to be a little bit more intense, especially in fluorescence. And so we'll want to not make the same mistake as we did last time. We'll clip off that version of the picture. We can then hit control plus to zoom in on any sort of individual element. In this case, we don't have very uh, darkly stained large cells here. We just have a lot of uh, well-stained smaller elements. So we can still zoom in on any of those smaller elements. It's just that our box size might be rather large. So it might be helpful to do these at higher magnification if you're trying to look at this. But for example purposes, let's go ahead and just put a little box around this cell right here. We could also stretch and skew it to fit it a little bit better. Okay, so we have the box center around this Nissel body or cluster of Nissel bodies here. And I'll just do the same thing, analyze and measure. Ah, yes, it was still confused from when I was doing the set measurements, so let's fix that. Redirect to this image. Analyze, measure. Again, you'll see this number is well past 255, so um, just to keep things simple, we're gonna fix this image and put it back to 8-bit rather than 16. So, okay, trying this once more. Analyze, measure. Here we go. It is suggesting that the mean gray value of this particle I've selected here is around 66, again, out of 255. What's helpful is that the measurement will remain in the results window when I move this box just to the right of that, and I say, hey, uh, why don't you do that again? And we see that, in this case, it is a lot closer to complete blackness here. It also gives us the area in pixels of the selection in both cases as well as the width and the height of the actual box in pixels. So in this case, we see that we have something like 66 over 12. So that would be a signal to noise ratio to look at. So let's go ahead and slap that into a calculator to see what that ratio is. So 66 divided by 12 is 5.5. Let's remember that number for a little moment. I'll just minimize this because what we can do is we can open up one of those other images we were looking at. One of the other images that was of the uh, inverted color Atlas page Nissel stain. So let's take a look and see what we can get out of that. Atlas example of hippocampus color invert Nissel. We go ahead and open with image J once again. Interesting. Ah, it has decided to be a little bit more complicated. So let's go ahead and convert this into the proper image type. This may happen to you. We want to convert this into an 8 bit grayscale image. It seems to be two channels. So let's undo that real quick. Oof. That is not a pleasant color to look at. All right. Image color split channels because there's a lot going on here. We don't need this green channel. We got this red channel. We can convert this red channel into something else. And it's already 8-bit, but I believe we just need to convert the color to grayscale. So there should be an option to desaturate it. Alternatively, though, it may be sufficient to just do this by selecting an individual element, and it'll still be on a scale of 0 to 255. So let's go ahead and just zoom way in there, take one of these horribly pixelated cell body things here, draw a little box around it. 
we'll make sure that our set measurements is directed to the correct thing here. In this case, this picture. And then analyze measure. Where is our box here? Results. Okay. So we've got a pretty wacky area measurement here because this is in different units. You'll see microns up here. Now, what we have here, though, is that we have that this is a very bright uh, granule. It's at a 131 uh, color out of 255. If we are to move this into a more black area nearby, let's say right about here, and then do the analyze measure once again, it'll spit out this and it gives us nine. So remember, the ratio between these two numbers up here for when we did the other grayscale image was about 5.5. The ratio between this is probably going to be a little bit more substantial. So let's see what that number comes out to be. So we're going to go 131 divided by 9.4 is 13.9. So signal to noise ratio is really outstanding in this case. But again, that makes sense because this is being used for the Rat Brain Atlas and is being published. Actual experimental images might not have this good of a signal to noise ratio because this is heavily curated to be as good of a picture as possible. That said, you want to maybe consider this as your mode of making a basis of comparison. So you can use this signal to noise ratio to compare different things. We see that our stain using it um, as we did gives a lower signal to noise ratio, but the signal to noise ratio isn't bad. Anything close to one, definitely bad, because one means that it's a 50-50 it's a chance of what you're looking at is either background or the stain. So you can't tell the difference. A signal to noise ratio of two means that it kind of stands out from the background, but probably not that well. A signal to noise ratio of five and above means that you could probably see the differences of the elements versus the background. So the higher signal to noise ratio, the more outstanding things just pop out from the background, as we certainly see in this bright red coloring here. Now, even though this isn't as bright, we still say that there's a good signal to noise ratio here, so we're not too concerned. And the fact that the background is actually close to a stark black color, being very close to a value of zero for the mean, is very helpful in letting us know, okay, there isn't a lot of background staining or background fluorescence that we have to worry about in this image here. So as far as the statistics you can run, you can do a lot of comparisons of different ratios. Like you could look at, okay, well, how is the red coloring of this multicolor image? And how does that compare with the control stain or what the default stain is supposed to look like before we modify it? The same thing can be done with intensity analysis like we just did, where even though it doesn't match like the archetypal Atlas page stain, it's still a good signal to noise ratio, especially compared to some other possibilities. All right, so with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and do a quick run through once more, just for example purposes. So we can open up a multicolor image. I will pick one at 10x in this case. For a multicolor image, you want to make sure that you set your measurements correctly. So set measurements will redirect to this picture here. Have these ones checked off accordingly. And we want to analyze the colors. First, we have to determine a selection. So it's up to you whether you want to do a rectangle, just focus on a general area or if you want to use the polygon tool to trace out a chunk of an area accordingly. Once you have your area selected, like let's say this thing right here, then we can do analyze color histogram. It will provide us with this table of results, giving us the mean red, green, and blue values. These and the standard deviations are arguably the most important ones that it's going to supply you. And these are what you want to copy down into an Excel spreadsheet. Then when you move over to a different cell layer in the same image, you can just click with the arrow key in the middle of the box, move it over and say, hey, what does this one look like? 
So after you've, of course, copied down what's in the results table, because this does get overwritten each time, we go to analyze color histogram once more. We see that's replaced the values, but it does keep every color histogram window open until you close it. So let's go ahead and pull up this new one here, and then one of the previous ones here. So we can see that this older one and this newer one, they do differ a bit, where the red values have a little bit more variation in them, and they're probably a little bit more brighter colored. Um, so these are largely similar between the two areas, so there's not too much difference in the stand there. What might be more important for you is if you're doing specific analysis of the stained elements in a picture. So we zoom in and then redraw. You may want to standardize your measurement to a specific size. And again, you could do that with edit, selection, specify. Specify the exact size in pixels or converted units. And we can go to analyze color histogram. Again, it gives us a stain value for this one uh, nissel full cell. We then can move this down right next door, do analyze, well, hold on. We definitely want to copy this first, so be sure to copy this information to Excel. Then analyze color histogram. This gets refreshed. We get a new histogram to compare it against. So again, copy this stuff to Excel. We don't need to save and copy the histograms unless you have specific analysis you want to do with that. However, with these stained elements, you will find that there might be a little bit more variability, there might be a lot darker coloring, and then something that is more of this sort of lighter color background will have color shifted more toward the right edge. Okay, so let's go ahead and close out some of these other things here. Close that, this thing, this thing. Now, if you're trying to do fluorescent images, the quick way to do that is pulling open your fluorescent image of interest. And you can either look at a specific area or quadrant. We're going to do a just general area first. So I'll pick this sort of shape here arbitrarily. We'll go to Analyze, Set Measurements to redirect it to this picture again. Analyze, Measure. Ah. Again, I forgot to convert this, so hold on, let's do that. Hopefully you won't have to do this as often, but ideally you want to convert this into an 8-bit image. Otherwise, you're gonna confuse some of the numbers. So let's always go with 8-bit image. We've converted to 8-bit grayscale. Hasn't really changed the image quality at all. So we'll go again to analyze, measure. Here are the correct numbers. So we get the average gray value. It's pretty close to zero, which is black color. So that's all well and good. Thankfully, with this type of analysis, it doesn't refresh and overwrite what was there previously. So we could just move this box up to here and see what this layer is measured as. Analyze, measure. We see that it is a lot closer than uh, the first one to the white value. So 74 out of 255 versus 15 out of 255. Zero being black, 255 being white. We can plug these into a calculator to figure the signal to noise ratio. So that is 74 over 15, bam. Signal to noise ratio is 4.93, kind of close to like five or so, which I've mentioned before is a decent number. What's also good is that the background is closest to black, suggesting that there isn't a lot of background fluorescence or background staining. If, however, you want to focus in on particular elements, specific nissel bodies, perhaps, then you'll have to select those individually and do something like this where we draw a very teeny tiny box and measure that and then move it over next door if you can grab the inside and then analyze that. And these all can be copied into Excel. We see that the area of this teeny tiny thing is much smaller in the amount of pixels. And the mean brightness value of this granule is about 51. So not too different from that large bright band that we selected before in more zoomed out picture. And the background coloring 
is pretty close to black, much like just encompassing this whole area is because of so much black space in between each of these Nissel bodies shown here. And again, you can figure out signal to noise ratio. This is sort of around five, I can tell. So let's go ahead and compute it real quick. That's 51 over 12. So signal to noise ratio is about 4.25. You can use these signal to noise ratio values to compare the efficacy of different stains under different conditions. And in particular, how well your signal to noise ratio is for one condition versus another. Especially when one of those conditions is the classic way of doing something, and you are trying to see how similar or how different things are when you change that method of stain. So, hopefully, this video has been helpful, instructive, etc. And as always, just uh, ask any questions you have in the comments and I'll see you in the next video.